It looks even better now. <laughs> Last video in the new place. No pressure. There we go. Oh, my dryer's still going. I'll turn that back on in a second. Take two. Chryso friends, welcome back to Opus L and I, where we are still doing our sew along. You may remember when I made my Elizabethan shirt, I told you that I was hosting one sew along every quarter over the course of a year with the loose goal of having an entire outfit finished by December. The first quarter's theme was undergarments, hence the shirt. This quarter's theme is torso coverings, so tunics or waistcoats or jackets, stuff like that. For my torso covering, I chose a Tudor kirtle to replace the wine-colored one that no longer fits me. Don't worry, I do have a plan to recycle it. I know, I know it's more of a dress and covers my entire body, but hear me out. Kirtles are meant to provide proper shaping and support for the torso and bust, and I kind of can't build the rest of the outfit without it. So here we are. Just like the shirt, I am using the typical Tudor pattern and research for this project to see how easy it is to scale, grade, make, and wear. I'll be making a side lacing version because I prefer a smooth front and would rather any skirt slit gapping happen on the sides rather than in the front. It will allow easy access to my pocket as well for essentials like phone, keys, meds, and this time I am going to try lacing rings instead of eyelets so the outside of the bodice will stay nice and smooth. Everyone go grab your cuppa. In honor of Pride Month, I am drinking LGBT from the Lake Missoula Tea Company. It is a fruity, spicy black tea with orange, coconut peel, and pink peppercorn. Not usually a combination I gravitate to, but it's surprisingly good. I also want to take this moment to do a quick PSA here. It's been a hot minute since I did one. <clears throat> this is a radically aggressively inclusive space. I'm queer. My family is queer. On this channel, we actively pursue an anti-racist, anti-turf agenda. We are committed to researching not only the pretty clothes of the past, but the not-so-pretty historical context in which those clothes were worn. We pursue social justice and don't subscribe to the paradox of tolerance. No Nazis in Valhalla. Now, let's get into it. Supplies gathered. The patterns in the typical Tudor are drawn on a grid where one square equals one inch, so I got some one inch dot pattern paper from Wawak, link in the description, to help me scale it up. I'm using my quilters ruler and a curved ruler to get nice smooth lines. The measurements of the hypothetical person this pattern is drafted for are in the front of the book, so I can transfer the pattern as is and then adjust to my measurements. Even though this hypothetical person is only 5 foot 2, I'm going to keep the length the same because I am short waisted and I have a feeling that the side length will be just perfect. Once the adjusted pattern is finished, I can make a quick mock-up to check how the bodice fits me. 
I made it out of one layer of my fashion linen because I have tons, but honestly, I should have used at least two layers or a different heavier fabric to prevent stretching. To make sure that the side seams won't collapse when I lace them up, I'm adding quick and dirty boning channels along each side, and I'll use zip ties as boning. The changes I made were to add about two inches to the waist, subtract an inch from a bust, which I should not have done and will add that back in for future curdles, changing the angle of the back shoulder straps and lengthening the shoulder straps. I have a long bust point to shoulder measurement, but narrow shoulders, so I usually have to make some changes in those areas. After I figured out all the changes I needed to make, I'll transfer those to a second pattern draft and use that for my curdle. After I figured out all the changes I needed to make, I'll transfer those to a second pattern draft and use that for my kirtle. This pattern has no seam allowances included, which I honestly prefer for sewing purposes, but that means I have to trace both sides of every pattern piece individually along the sewing lines. It's worth it though. I'll cut a front and back from linen and an interlining of cotton twill because the linen canvas is packed, of course.
The kirtle calls for an extra front panel of buckram or canvas for additional stiffening, so I'll draft a pattern piece for that as well. And then look up how to make buckram because I don't have any and all of my canvas is packed. Google returns several different ways to make buckram, the traditional way with gum trasaganth, which I don't have, with gum arabic, which is packed, with hide or fish glue, which is packed, or with wheat starch, which is packed. I do have cornstarch, but not enough to make starch for this project, so I'm going with the last ditch effort, diluted PVA white glue. It won't be moldable since PVA dries into a permanent polymer, but on the other hand, I'll be able to wash this with no ill effects, so pros and cons. Because the buckram won't be moldable once it's dry, I'm using some towels and bubble wrap to create a curve to the piece. It dried to a nice crisp stiffness, not unlike cardstock. The next step is to add a single line of boning down the front of the buckram layer for added structure. I'm using synthetic whalebone from Burnley and Trowbridge and some white twill tape for the boning channel. break to trace and cut the lining, I'm using some handkerchief weight black linen. Normally black isn't the color I'd choose to use for lining, but everything else is, you guessed it, packed. This fabric is color fast, so I'm not too worried about it bleeding or showing through. I didn't have quite a big enough piece to cut the front end back together, so I ended up needing a back seam, which is fine. The next step in the instructions is to base the buckram and twill interlining together to act as one piece. I'm just taking huge pad stitches with quilting thread in a color I don't normally use. Once the interlining pieces are basted together, I'll put the fashion and interlining pieces front and back together and base them along the stitching line with a long running stitch. I don't have an exact green thread match, but I have a couple that are close enough. I'm trying to use up my stash of thread when it's good enough instead of always buying new thread. No need to consume more than I'll use. Now that everything is basted properly, the first proper assembly step is to sew the shoulders together. Once that is done, it's time to turn my attention to the skirt, which means ironing forever and ever. After a small eternity spent ironing, I'll scale up the skirt pattern pieces the same way I did the bodice pieces, this time adding length that I didn't before since all my height is in my legs.
time to trace the skirt pieces onto the linen. The skirt pieces are wider than the doubled fabric, so I will be piecing the corners. I'll arrange the piecing line along the straight grain so the seams don't affect the way the skirt drapes. The skirt will be gathered down to the bodice with knife pleats, two on the front and all along the back. Okay, so here is the worst part of this whole process. The book instructions say to cut the point out of the front of the skirt waist and then sew the skirt to the bodice. So I did, and the skirt front was wonky. So I ripped it out and I sewed it again, and again. And it still looks wonky, but I have run out of time, patience, and skirt front margin of error. It is what it is now.
you to all of my current and continuing Kofi members, especially my newest members. Your support and the support of all my members and croissants makes it easier to do what I do and provide quality content for everyone. Thank you so much. Stick around after this brief commercial break to see how I finish up this curdle. The next step is to grade the bodice seam allowances and then to tack them down with a herringbone stitch. Next time I make a curdle, I plan to do this in a slightly different order, like I did with the burgundy one. I'll grade and herringbone stitch the bodice first, and then I'll attach the skirt to the inside of the bodice without cutting the V. The skirt will be attached at the waist with a herringbone stitch on the inside, and the bottom point of the bodice will be attached to the skirt from the outside with a felling stitch. I find that the skirt lays so much more nicely that way and doesn't bunch weirdly at the point. And now time to add the lining. After I sew the back two pieces together, I will lay the lining pieces on the bodice front and back and turn the edges under and pin so that the lining is about two or three millimeters smaller than the fashion fabric. The curved edges along the straps will be graded to about a quarter inch seam allowance so they will be easy to turn under. After everything is pinned, I will fill the lining in place.
Next, I will add the lacing holes. On my burgundy kirtle, I sewed eyelets, but on this one I wanted to try out rings. I have some jewelry findings that don't have a split in them where the thread could come out, so I think I'm going to try those and see if they work. I'll be employing the spiral lacing technique wherein the rings are equidistant but offset so that the lace zigzags up the sides. Once the dress is all assembled, I'll do a quick and dirty evening up of the hem and let it hang overnight in order to allow the diagonal skirt seams to stretch as much as they need to. morning, I'll trim everything up that stretched, which thankfully wasn't much. I went with about a half inch rolled hem and it worked okay, but I think when I make another kirtle I will do a hem facing instead. The wider the rolled hem, the more it pulls on the diagonal, and while it looks fine when ironed, it's not as smooth and elegant as I know a hem facing could be. And even though this was intended to be a one-off garment, I think I've convinced myself to make another kirtle.
Thanks for coming along with me today. I am glad to have the basics of a late period outfit again. It is partner's preferred era, so I like to have at least one thing to wear to coordinate with him. And this kirtle can be the base for several different looks. By adding a gown, a waistcoat, a doublet, or even just sleeves, I'll be able to create several different modular outfits, and you know how I feel about that. If you're interested in jumping on the Sew Along bandwagon, you can join my Discord server. The link is in the description. Once you join, you'll get a personal welcome message telling you how to agree to the rules and access the rest of the server. The next seasonal Sew Along will run from July 1st to September 21st, and the theme will be leg coverings. If you enjoyed this video, like, subscribe, and share. It really does help the channel grow. You can find me on other platforms as Opus LNI, and all relevant links will be in the description, including the link to my Kofi where you can find my shop, which will reopen July 1st, or become a member. Until next time, be kind, do the work, continue supporting marginalized people, and keep creating. Huil.